Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the senator from Texas. And Madam President, I rise today to speak in support of the amendment to keep guns out of the hands of known or suspected terrorists. The Orlando attack again exposed a dangerous loophole in our law that allows known or suspected terrorists to legally purchase guns through the National Criminal Instant Background Check System, known as NICS. We call this loophole the terror gap. Let me explain what that means. There are currently 10 categories of people who are blocked from buying guns through the National Instant Criminal Background Check, known as NICS, and here they are. They include felons, those under felony indictment, fugitives from justice, drug users or addicts, those committed to mental institutions or adjudicated as mentally defective, foreign nationals here unlawfully, or non-immigrant visas, such as temporary workers, those dishonorably discharged from the military, and those with a domestic violence restraining order. But, one group that cannot be blocked from buying guns are those who are known or suspected terrorists on the FBI's Consolidated Terrorist Watch List. They can buy guns, but aliens can't, dishonorably discharged can't, uh, people of renowned citizen can't, drug users can't, fugitives from justice, felonies, etc. Those are the ones that cannot. We know that individuals on the list have exploited this loophole. According to FBI data, over the past 11 years, the success rate for known or suspected terrorists who undergo background checks to buy guns is 91%. 91% of over 2,000 by GAO study have been found to be able to purchase guns. So closing this dangerous loophole was first proposed by the Bush Justice Department in 2007. In fact, we derive the language in our amendment from that original bill. Our amendment would give the Attorney General the authority to block a gun sale to known or suspected terrorists. It also provides an appeal process, both administrative and judicial. Let me just read that language because it's directly out of the 2007 Bush Justice Department. The Attorney General may deny the transfer of a firearm if the Attorney General determines, based on the totality of circumstances, that the transferee represents a threat to public safety based on a reasonable suspicion that the transferee is engaged or has been engaged in conduct constituting or in preparation of, in aid of, or related to terrorism, or providing material support or resources, therefore, end quote. That's directly from that bill. In order to ensure that FBI would be alerted in the case of an individual like Omar Mateen, our amendment also includes language proposed by Senators Leahy and Nelson. This language would ensure that any suspected terrorist who tries to buy a gun within five years of being investigated for terrorism crimes would automatically trigger a notification to the Justice Department about the attempted purchase. So, as you know, in 2013 and 2014, the FBI conducted two inquiries on the Orlando gunman related to suspected terrorism. Even though the FBI was investigating him for possible terrorism, and at one point placed him on the FBI's terrorist watch list, it had no power to prevent him from purchasing weapons at a gun store. That's the key thing. It had no power to prevent him from purchasing a gun at a gun store. Had this amendment been in place, it would have allowed the Attorney General to know about the Orlando shooter's attempt to buy a Sig Sauer MCX assault rifle and then investigate to determine whether to deny the gun based off this man's entire history. So let me now explain how the terrorist screening database 
also known as the Consolidated Terrorist Watch List works. Under this amendment, the Attorney General would look to this database to identify a known or suspected terror. To be included in this database, the FBI must have reasonable suspicion based on a totality of circumstances and objective facts that a person is a known or suspected terrorist. Information is derived from intelligence and law enforcement sources at home and abroad. To ensure that only individuals who pose a threat to national security are placed on this list, FBI Director Comey told the Intelligence Committee in February that information is thoroughly vetted. The FBI's process is also rigorously audited to reduce the number of false positives. There are approximately, and here it is, one million records in this database, but less than half of 1% are US persons. This is the net. This is the terrorist screening database. This is the product of intelligence and law enforcement. It is, it is scrutinized, and if it is worthy, it is placed on this database. One million records maintained by FBI's terrorist screening center, fewer than 5,000 US persons. That's one half of 1%. So this is a targeted list that's carefully put together. It's focused on known or su suspected terrorists believed to represent a risk to public safety. Our amendment also includes, do well, one thing I want to say, and I will repeat this when I discuss Senator Collins' bill, but many people confuse this list with the no-fly list. The no-fly list is this dark blue center it is 81,000 records. It's maintained by the FBI's Terror Screening Center, and it has fewer than 1,000 uh, persons. Then there is a selectee list. It is even smaller. It's 28,000 records maintained by FBI's Terror Screening Center, fewer than 1,700 US persons. But you can see, if you're going to have a net the net has to be big enough, and I'm going to explain to you why in a moment. But our amendment also includes due process protections. It allows an individual who believes they were mistakenly denied a gun to learn the reason for the denial and to appeal that decision, both administratively with the Justice Department and judicially. This is the same appeals process currently in place for anyone who believes they are wrongly denied a gun through the NICS database, which I just went through a few minutes ago. Now let me speak about two Republican proposals and why I think they wouldn't work. And I'm delighted that the senator from Texas is on the floor. Uh, we both sit on the Judiciary Committee. I've had the pleasure of working with him for a number of years. But his amendment requires the probable cause standard to be met. And that's a very high standard. Because if that standard is met, there's already enough evidence to arrest the person, search their home and car, seize their property, and indict the person. It's not a practical standard to block a gun purchase. And it would just be an infinitesimal part of what is actually out there. The proposal also says that somebody should be entitled to a full-blown contested hearing with counsel. But if this hearing is not completed within 72 hours, the gun sale goes through. The hearing would require the filing of an emergency petition, the service of process, the opportunity for the individual to get a lawyer, and then the actual full-blown hearing. This is nearly impossible to achieve within 72 hours. And if it isn't achieved, the terrorist gets the gun. Senator Collins has also circulated alternative language. Now, I consider myself a friend of hers. I have great respect for her. We serve on the Intelligence Committee together. But my view 
is that her alternative is not enough to close the loophole that creates this terror gap and allows terrorists to buy guns. This alternative would focus on narrow parts of the database. This no-fly list, you can see how small it is, and the selectee list, which is here. The selectee list includes those persons who can fly, but who receive additional screening before boarding a plane. Now, focusing so narrowly on these two smaller sets is important to listen to now, is not enough, and I'd like to tell you why. Um, it would leave out a huge number of known or suspected terrorists, one, as you can see, um, and I've gone through that. I've gone through the no-fly list. So if we were to focus only on the no-fly list and the selectee list, we would be leaving out 888 foreign nationals, names given to us by law enforcement, intelligence sources, both here and among our allies, on the, who are on the terrorist watch list. And approximately 2,300 U.S. persons determined by the FBI to be known or suspected terrorists. Focusing on the smaller lists leaves out close to 90% of known or suspected terrorists, covering both U.S. persons and foreigners. I need to remind my colleagues, you don't need to be a U.S. person to legally buy guns in this country. That makes it important to understand how this list is larger. Let me give you an example. Travelers using the visa waiver program can legally buy guns. There are 20 million travelers in that program annually, and more than 100,000 of them don't go home when they should. Now I'd like to share just one example where a known or suspected terrorist was on the FBI's radar but had not been placed on the no-fly list. Over the weekend, my staff went through 86 cases and pulled out some of them. I have them here, and I'd like at this time just to mention one. Nader Sadeh, a U.S. citizen, was radicalized and became a devoted follower of ISIL. The FBI received a critical tip about Sade in April of 2015. The tip included a detailed account of his radicalization and support of ISIL. This is all available in a 13-page criminal complaint. In May, Sade flew from New York City to Jordan. He was detained and later arrested by the FBI. Now here's someone who clearly met the definition of a known or suspected terrorist, but was permitted to fly out of a major U.S. airport in the city where the 9-11 attacks occurred. This shows the danger of focusing only on narrow subsets of the terrorist watch list. To me, that doesn't make sense. There's broad support for our amendment including more than 240 organizations and community leaders around the country. Madam uh, President, I would ask that that list be added to the congressional record directly following my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. The Justice Department and the White House support this amendment. They believe it's a workable approach to help prevent terrorists from obtaining weapons. Justice and we worked with Justice, and Justice made some additions to our amendment, released a statement of support. Let me read it in part. This amendment gives the Justice Department an important additional tool to prevent the sale of guns to suspected terrorists by licensed firearms dealers while ensuring protection of the department's operational and investigative sensitivities. 38 senators have co-sponsored the amendment, including Republican Senator Mark Kirk, making it bipartisan. Now, closing the terror gap is an important step, but it isn't enough. And let me tell you why. Today, you can buy a gun at a gun show, 
without a background check. As a matter of fact, my chief of staff, a woman, was pursued at a gun show to buy a 50 caliber rifle, which is a sniper rifle. The bullet can go for a mile and go through a brick wall. You can buy a gun on the internet without a background check. You can buy a gun from an individual on the private market without a background check. That's why we must also pass the amendment offered by Senators Murphy, Schumer, Booker, and Blumenthal. This would ensure guns sold at gun shows over the internet and from person to person are subject to background checks. If we don't make that change, known or suspected terrorists will still be able to buy guns at gun shows with no questions asked. Now, with ISIL intent on perpetrating and inspiring attacks in this country, there is increased urgency to make it harder for terrorists. And to me, this isn't a gun control issue. It's really a national security issue. And if there's any doubt about that, I want to just share briefly with you a part of our CIA director, John Brennan's remarks from last week's open hearing of the Senate Intelligence Committee. He said, and I quote, we judge that ISIL is training and attempting to deploy operatives for further attacks. ISIL has a large cadre of Western fighters who could potentially serve as operatives for attacks in the West. The group is probably exploring a variety of means for infiltrating operatives into the West, including refugee flows, smuggling routes, and legitimate methods of travel. Further, as we have seen in Orlando, San Bernardino, and elsewhere, ISIL is attempting to inspire attacks by sympathizers who have no direct links to the group. Last month, for example, a senior ISIL figure publicly urged the group's followers to conduct attacks in their home countries if they were unable to travel to Syria and Iraq." End quote. Those are the words of the head of the world's most prominent intelligence agency. And ladies and gentlemen, we should heed them. We know ISIL adherents are, and sympathizers are already inside the United States. In fact, just since March of 2014, federal prosecutors have charged 85 men and women around the country in connection with the Islamic State. 33 have been convicted. We also know that terrorists are well aware just how weak our gun laws are, and they urge their followers to exploit them. In 2011, a man by the name of Adam Gadan, an al-Qaeda spokesman, he's actually an American who went to Syria and was a suicide bomber, urged terrorists to take advantage of our weak gun laws. Gadan put out on the internet, America, and this is a quote, America is absolutely awash with easily obtainable firearms. This bears repeating. Terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIL, Al-Nusra, and others know that our gun laws are weak and can be exploited. So, Mr. Madam President, we can't continue to do nothing in the face of this potential death and even potential devastation. I've been fighting to reduce gun violence throughout my career. Since my days as a county supervisor and as mayor of San Francisco, I know how difficult it is to make changes because the opposition is so extreme and opposes any measure to curtail gun violence, no matter what it is. And so it was against all odds that the assault weapons legislation passed in 1994. And the gun lobby fought hard, not only to defeat the amendment, which succeeded, but to defeat those in the House who supported it. And that started its own reign of terror. When the Brady background check passed in 1993, multiple cloture motions on the bill failed before it ultimately passed with 63 votes. 
But that bill did not cover sales at gun shows, private sales, or internet sales, which have increased significantly. After the Newtown shooting, I thought we would do something to stem the tide of these weapons. We tried the, to- The Senator's time is expired. I am just about finished, if you just could give me another minute or so. We is tried to renew the ban on Without assault. objection. Thank you. We tried to renew the ban on assault weapons. That failed. We tried to expand the background checks, even through a compromise offered by Senator Manchin. That effort failed. I remember when the vote on the background checks failed, the New York Daily News put the photos, photos of the Newtown victims on the front cover. There were 20 young children, aged six and seven, and their, educa and their educators. And the headline read right across it, for shame. So it's time for us to stand up. It's time to force elected representatives to take action. We must expand background checks. We must make sure the government can stop a gun from being sold to a known or suspected terrorist. And that's not too much to ask. I thank you, Madam President. I appreciate it. I yield the floor.